where Aquino claimed that flying him, a civilian, in front or before military tribunals would be a violation of his right to due process. The Supreme Court did not agree with him. The court, in effect, said that the guarantee of due process does not refer to any particular process for as long as the requirements are met. So even if civilians are tried by military tribunals, there would still be compliance with due process. After Marcos was gone, the Supreme Court lost no time abandoning Aquino. In the case of Oliver v. Military Commission No. 34, the Supreme Court said that trial of civilians by military tribunals at a time when civilian courts are open and functioning would be a violation of due process because the proceedings in military tribunals are more geared towards military discipline and therefore would be inappropriate for the trial of civilians. Some safeguards for trial of civilians in ordinary courts would not be present in military tribunals because there is a need for more discipline, for instance, or expeditious resolution of cases, in which case some processes may contain less guarantees designed to protect the interests or liberties of the persons affected. So, in effect, the decision of the Supreme Court in Olaguer was that military tribunals had no jurisdiction and, accordingly, the cases that they tried would have to be tried anew before civilian courts. Then the Supreme Court realized the problem with this. If you're now going to retry thousands of civilians, then that would be unworkable. So, subsequently, it came up with the idea that if the decision of the tribunal was for acquittal, then that would be final, and therefore the person acquitted by a military tribunal would no longer have to be tried by a civilian court, meaning those who were convicted would be the ones to be tried before civilian courts. But in the case of Tan v. Barrios, the Supreme Court further backpedaled because even if you would only retry those who had been acquitted, it would still entail a lot of work. So, the court said it would make not much of a difference whether the result was acquittal or conviction. Accordingly, the court said if it could not be shown that there was a clear violation of due process, then the decisions of the military tribunals would be recognized and they would also be deemed as final. So, only a limited number would then be subjected to civilian trial, those in which it could be readily said that there was indeed violation of the guarantee of due process. In regard to bail, the general rule is everyone should be entitled to bail. And the exceptions would be if the accused is charged with a crime punishable by reclusion perpetua and the evidence of guilt is strong. So, it's not enough that the crime charged is one punishable by reclusion perpetua. The evidence of guilt must also be strong because if it's not, then there's no point trying to make a person stay in jail in the meantime while awaiting the outcome of his case if eventually he may be acquitted. Because if he gets acquitted subsequently but he has to stay in jail in the meantime, then he would have sacrificed so much, he would have lost his liberty for some time. And that is a very high price to pay. So, consistent with the presumption of innocence, the right to bail guarantees an opportunity for a person to enjoy 
his liberty while awaiting the outcome of the criminal case. Being presumed innocent, then he should stay out of jail in the meantime. It's only when he's charged with a particularly high crime and the evidence of guilt is strong that he may have to stay behind bars in the meantime because the temptation to flee would be much higher in those kinds of crimes. In regard to bail, take note also of what the Supreme Court had said with regard to availability of bail on appeal for someone who might have been charged with a non-bailable offense but was only convicted by the trial court of a bailable offense. So he was charged, for instance, with murder. But the trial court convicted him only of homicide, bailable. He appeals, claiming that still he is innocent and therefore should be acquitted. So since he appealed from a judgment of homicide only, and which is bailable, can he be allowed to post bail during appeal? In the case of Obosa versus Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court said that he will not be entitled to post bail. But he has already been convicted of a crime that is bailable. So why should not he be allowed to post bail? The explanation given by the court was that when an appeal is taken from that judgment, it has the effect of reviving the original complaint or information. Since an appeal opens the entire case for review, so as between the appellate or before the appellate court, it's as if it is now confronted anew with the original charge, which is for a non-bailable offense. So he might have been convicted of a bailable offense, but since the original charge was for a non-bailable offense, before the appellate court, it's as if he is being charged anew with that non-bailable offense. Therefore, no entitlement to bail. In extradition, of course, be aware of the gradual shift of the Supreme Court from what it earlier said the case of Mark Jimenez, that's the case of Portanan, until eventually the case of Hong Kong versus Olalia. In the case of Portanan, the Supreme Court said that the potential extraditee is not entitled to bail. Bail is only available to those who are charged with the crime. A potential extraditee is not charged with a crime in the Philippines. The extradition is merely an administrative process. Therefore, if you want to post bail, he must apply for bail in that court in which the criminal case is pending, which would be that of the state to which he is supposed to be extradited. An exception to that rule would be if it can be shown that he is not a flight risk and there are humanitarian reasons. But that would bring us to the subsequent case of Rodriguez versus Honorable Presiding Judge. The Rodriguez here are the Rodriguez spouses who allegedly engaged in insurance fraud in the U.S. by making it appear that the wife died, therefore the husband was entitled to recover the proceeds of the insurance. 
it turns out to do why it cost so much a life. So the American authorities pursued the Rodriguez. So if you remember those cases in municipal corporation, Rodriguez and Marquez, this is it. Since Rodriguez left the U.S. and there was a criminal case that was about to be filed, the issue was whether he was a fugitive from justice. And the Supreme Court said the fugitive from justice as referred to in the local government code does not necessarily have to refer to someone who has already been charged. Someone who is yet to be charged, knowing that there is a charge forthcoming, will be considered as a fugitive from justice. But in subsequent case of Rodriguez, the Supreme Court said that Rodriguez could not be considered as a fugitive from justice because he left the U.S. long before the case against him was filed. So it is to be presumed that he didn't know that there would be an impending criminal case against him when he left the U.S. Therefore, no presumption that he was a fugitive from justice. Rodriguez was able to serve as governor of Quezon for about two or three terms. But the American authorities still maintain their desire to have them, Rodriguez and his wife, extradited to the U.S. So now you have the case of Rodriguez versus Honor Honorable Rosalinda, because when the extradition petition was filed before the RTC judge, he allowed them to post bail at one million pesos each. When this was questioned, the judge was told to decide the issue as to whether they are entitled to post bail or not. So what the judge did was to wait for the decision in the case of Mark Jimenez. When the decision was rendered, the judge immediately canceled the bail bonds of both Rodriguez's spouses. So this case went up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said the judge committed a grave abuse of discretion. He misapplied the decision in the case of Mark Jimenez. It was improper for him to immediately cancel the bail bond without notice and hearing. While it is true that under Jimenez, the potential extraditee is not entitled to notice and hearing, considering that there is no right to bail, it does not mean that if bail had been previously allowed, then the court can immediately cancel the bail bond without notice and hearing. So what now? The Supreme Court said, you have to remember that under the ruling in the case of Mark Jimenez, there is an exception. Namely, if the potential extraditee does not appear to be a flight risk, and there are humanitarian reasons. Since bail had previously been given, then the least that the judge should have done was to notify Rodriguez and his wife and hold the hearing to determine whether their case falls within the exception or not, and not simply cancel outright. By the time the Supreme Court decided the case, the male Rodriguez had already agreed to voluntarily extradite himself to the U.S., leaving behind the wife. So insofar as the case was concerned, it had already become moot and academic relative to the male Rodriguez, but still alive with regard to the female Rodriguez. And here the Supreme Court said 
the exception applies. There is no showing that the female Rodriguez is a flight risk. And, more importantly, there are humanitarian reasons. For one, she's already rather old, in her late 60s, and for another, she is sickly. So these considerations would allow for her to be covered by the exception under the Mark Jimenez rule. Then came the case of Hong Kong. This time, the Supreme Court decided to revisit its ruling in the case of Morgana. The Supreme Court highlighted the fact that we value human dignity and promote respect for human rights. And the Supreme Court, this together with the trend in international law, to protect and recognize a person's entitlement to life, liberty, and due process. This should translate to a general rule where everyone should be as much as possible, whether in civil or administrative proceedings, entitled to remain outside while their cases are pending. So if an accused is entitled to bail, then it would also follow that a potential externality should await his fate outside the jail if warranted. Because it is the general rule that everyone should be free in the meantime. And also the Supreme Court said if in regard to a potential deportee he is entitled to post bail, then there is no reason why a potential externality should not similarly be entitled to bail. If you notice closely, in the decision of the Supreme Court in the case of Mark Jimenez, even as it was pointed out that a potential deportee was entitled to bail, still the Supreme Court concluded that it did not apply to a potential externality. But in the case of Hong Kong, the Supreme Court was now ready to make use of the example of a potential deportee as a basis for also holding that a potential externality should be entitled to bail. Then the Supreme Court said that unlike, however, an accused in which there is a presumption of innocence, in the case of a potential externality, there is an assumption that he is a flight risk, he is a fugitive. Therefore, the same rules would not apply in regard to bail. While to deprive an accused of the right to bail, the prosecution would have to prove that he falls under the recognized exceptions. In the case of a potential externality, the burden is on him that is entitled to bail by proving by clear and convincing evidence that he is not a flight risk. So the burden is on him and he would have to prove it by a higher quantum of evidence compared to other proceedings. It is clear and convincing evidence that would be below proof beyond reasonable doubt but higher than the preponderance of evidence. In Alejandro v. Cabuay, the issue here is about the entitlement of those who are not allowed to post bail to exercise their rights or freedoms, particularly privacy correspondence. The Supreme Court said they still have privacy correspondence but limited, consistent with the idea that they are behind bars. So they cannot have the same amount of privacy of 
correspondence, uh, publications and correspondence, like those who are outside. Because they are prisoners, then the prison authorities may read their letters unless they are communicating with their lawyers and there is that official attorney-client relationship. In which case, the prison authorities may only monitor but not read the contents. But the envelope must be appropriately marked in order that the prison authorities would know it has something to do with the attorney-client relationship. So that's the case of Alejandro versus Kabuai. In regard to the presumption of innocence, <coughs> this is a starting point in a prosecution. The prosecution would have to overcome that by coming up with proof beyond reasonable doubt. So anything less would not be enough to overcome this presumption. It has been explained that the presumption of innocence and the corresponding need for proof beyond reasonable doubt to overcome it is a dictate of due process. You cannot convict based on evidence less than proof beyond reasonable doubt. <coughs> and there was an explanation in an American case as to why you require proof beyond reasonable doubt instead of any other quantum of proof. It was explained that this again depends on the value that society places on different things in life. You cannot equate the value of life with that of property. So when you are dealing with criminal cases, you are dealing with issues that affect life or liberty. In civil cases, you may only be dealing with property. So when, it, when you demand preponderance of evidence, there is a possibility that there is a 50-50 chance that the court may be mistaken in deciding one way or the other. So if the court favors the plaintiff, there is a 50-50 chance that he's, it is wrong. If it favors the defendant, the same chance. But when it comes to criminal cases, the balance is tilted in favor of the accused. If the court acquits, there may be a 90% chance that the, wrong, that the court is wrong, that the accused is really guilty. And if it convicts, there is a 10% chance that the court may be wrong, that the accused is really innocent. So you can see that it is still then in favor of the accused. There are greater chances of the court committing a mistake in favor of the accused compared to the court committing a mistake when it is merely dealing with civil cases. So why is that? Why are not the scales that balanced? And the reason again is because of the value placed by society on life and liberty. You cannot equate life and liberty with property. If the court commits a mistake when it comes to property rights, then it is not as painful, it is not as significant as when it commits a mistake relative to questions of life and liberty. So, if a person has been wrongfully sent to prison, that is something that society would like to prevent as much as possible. But if society may witness the commission of a wrong decision in regard to a property dispute, it is not as weighty. Therefore, the quantum of proof. In the case of Feeder International, the Supreme Court, in a passing 
line said that the presumption of innocence is available only to natural persons. So it's not available to juridical persons. The problem is, if ever in those rare instances that a corporation is accused of a crime, should not the same burden of proof and quantum of evidence apply? That the prosecution would still have to prove that the corporation is guilty as charged by proof beyond reasonable doubt. And that line in Feeder International, incidentally, did not also have footnote. So what is the basis of that pronouncement? We don't know. Anyway, if ever that is asked in the bar, then we refer to that case of Feeder International versus Court of Appeals. Relative to presumption of innocence would be the effective police proof. If the evidence for the prosecution and the accused are about the same, then there would be a quittal. Because it simply means that the prosecution has not been able to come up with evidence that would clearly prove the guilt of the accused beyond reasonable doubt. So if the evidence are about the same, then there must be a quittal. When does the presumption of innocence end? Does it end with conviction by the trial court such that if the accused appeals, there is no presumption of innocence during that appellate stage? That issue was very relevant in the case of Judge Adoracion Angeles. Judge Angeles, I don't know if she's still the presiding judge in one of the RTCs in Taloocan, because she's about to retire. So I don't know if she has already retired or she's still there. So at the time when she was charged, she was a presiding judge at one of the branches of the RTC in Taloocan. She was subsequently charged, however, with child abuse, maltreatment of house helpers. She was charged in Quezon City. After trial, she was found guilty. Since she was a presiding judge, should she be suspended in the meantime? Because how would you like to have a judge convicted still continue with the discharge of her judicial functions? Initially, the Supreme Court ordered her suspension. But in a subsequent resolution, the Supreme Court came up with the conclusion that presumption of innocence is not lost simply by conviction coming from the trial court. It only gets lost upon final conviction. So if the judge appealed, that means the decision against her was not yet final. So if she was still entitled to the presumption of innocence, she should be allowed to continue with the discharge of her judicial function. So the Supreme Court allowed Judge Sessions to resume her judicial functions. And shortly after this decision was rendered by the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeals acquitted Judge Sessions. So the issue has now become moot and academic. The same principle was also mentioned by the Supreme Court in passing, in the case of Trillanes. So more direct to the point would be the case of Judge Sessions. Because the issue had a direct bearing on whether she should be suspended or not. On 
and the right to be heard. This is primarily that of the accused. That he must be heard by himself. But this is better served by allowing him the services of counsel. Because as we have already explained earlier, with the assistance of counsel, the accused may be better able to protect and defend his interests. Because it is the police or it is the, the lawyers who know about the substantive and procedural law as well as the different styles on, on which or by which one can conduct his trials. So without a lawyer, an accused may be convicted, not because he's guilty, but because he didn't know how to properly protect his interest. In the United States, the Supreme Court, in the case of Ash, came up with a summation of how the right to counsel had developed through time, from the simpler life to the more complex society that we now have. So the more simple, or the simpler the lifestyle then, the lesser the need for the assistance of counsel. But with a society that has become more sophisticated and complex, the more that would also need assistance of lawyers. Because they are the ones who are supposed to be studying about these things and preparing themselves for whatever challenges may come about. In the case of People versus Liwana, we learn a lesson or two here about the perils of having to go home late at night, particularly for women. In this case, the victim went home past midnight, going home for a yapping. But that time, transportation is already scarce. A tricycle driver offered to give her a special a ride for a special rate. So she agreed. Not much of a choice, is it? And shortly after she rode the tricycle, some other guys also rode the tricycle. So they then proceeded, they passed by subdivision, and while they were moving the hands of the Wana also started to move, exploring her body. In time, they came across a vacant lot and they wanted to hold her up, but she only had about 60 pesos with her. So it was not worth it. They decided instead to raise her. After that, they started talking among themselves on killing her. She overheard the conversation and she pleaded with them not to kill her. And then they said, okay, we'll not give us 10,000. But of course, she didn't have the 10,000. So they started to battle until I think it got down to 2,000. To be delivered the uh, following morning in Guadalupe, there in Makati. So they arranged for a time in which the money would be delivered. <laughs> and they let her go. Of course, by the time they were supposed to meet at that designated spot in Guadalupe, the victim was already able to get in touch with the policeman. They, they then set up this entrapment operation. So when the guy showed up, the one, the policeman had no difficulty arresting him. Eventually he was charged and he claimed that there was inadequate assistance of counsel. And he made particular reference to the so-called Strickland standard that is being followed in the U.S. 
the Supreme Court said the strict land standard is too stringent for Philippine situation. So in the Philippines, for as long as the lawyer performed in accordance with what is expected of him under the rules of court and the code of professional responsibility, there is no need to make reference to so-called strict land standard. So all that we need would be our own standards. So the moral to be, left, to be learned from this case is if you are to go home late at night, make sure that you have more than 60 pesos with you. <laughs> So that's a case of the WANA and the so-called strict land standard. <coughs> the right to counsel, just like in rights of suspects, would require the presence of real counsel one who really has been admitted to the bar, one who has taken the oath and has been registered in the role of attorneys. Take the way the Supreme Court said in the case of Tooling that it can. In that case of Tooling, the accused have been charged with piracy. <coughs> They were represented by someone who they thought all along was a real lawyer because he really acted like a trial lawyer. The prosecution was able to present its side and the accused started to present their version. Then they discovered that the person who had been acting as their counsel was not really a lawyer. So what they did was to secure the services of a real lawyer. And with the assistance of this real lawyer, they waived their right to be represented by a real lawyer during the first part of the criminal prosecution. Is that valid or not? The Supreme Court said yes. Because at the time when they were represented, or when they waived their right to a real counsel, they already had a real, genuine counsel. So with, since there was an assistance of a real lawyer, then they could validly waive already their right to that representation earlier. So that's the case of Tulin. You very well know that the mistakes of lawyers bind their clients. Can you make use of lawyers as scapegoats? Yes, but only in rare circumstances. Like in the case of Guzman, Guzman was a Sandigan buyer. The lawyers here made use of the wrong remedy or procedural safeguard and therefore prejudiced the interest of their client. They were, the client was not able to present the evidence, the documents that he had according to him because of the wrong move of his lawyers. And to avoid a grave injustice, the Supreme Court allowed the reopening of the case, even if it had already been final and there was already entry of judgment. So in order not to sacrifice the rights and liberties of the accused, the case was reopened. On the right to be informed, this is something that the Supreme Court has used extensively at a time when the death penalty was still in the statute books. The right to be informed is basically meant to ensure that the accused would know what particular acts or omissions he may have done 
or failed to do, and which is now the subject matter of a criminal prosecution. Because if he doesn't know what he is being charged with, or what acts supposedly constituted a crime, then he would not be in a position to present his defense. So the need to be properly informed. At the same time, it would also enable the court to determine if the facts as alleged in the information, for instance, if they are proven, the same would constitute enough basis for conviction. One more reason, to enable the accused to determine if, by the allegations, he is entitled to avail of some defense that he already has, like acquittal or prior conviction. So in this case of right to be informed, how did the Supreme Court make use of it as a good way to avoid the imposition of the death penalty? Any slight variation between what is stated in the information and what would eventually be proven during trial would warrant the avoidance of the death penalty. Remember that at the time when death was still imposed as a penalty, most of the crimes were with regard to qualified rape. So the necessary elements here would be minority and relationship. The victim must be less than 18 years of age. And so far as the relationship is concerned, the victim must be the daughter, stepdaughter, or the niece, for instance, of the one who committed the rape, or the descendant of the one who committed the rape. So how did the court make use of this right to avoid the death penalty? In one case, the information described the victim as minor. So we very well know someone who is below 18 is a minor. In this case, no problem. She really was a minor. The Supreme Court said that's not enough. You have to specify the correct age. Since you did not, then the accused would only be found guilty of simple rape. Therefore, no death penalty. In one case again, or I think more than two cases, the accused was described as stepfather. But the court also found that he was not married to the mother of the victim. So the court concluded that that description, stepfather, is wrong. He is not a stepfather because he is not married to the mother of the victim. The term stepfather is reserved for those who are married. And that would relate now to their relationship to the children of the woman that they married. In another case, the description was uncle. And the court said, uncle by what? Consanguinity or affinity? Since you did not specify, then you cannot also impose the death penalty. In these cases, for instance, would it really have mattered that much, the slight difference? Whether it is by consanguinity or by affinity, it would still be the same relationship of uncle to niece. But, as I said, this was a way out for the Supreme Court. And I think the reason for that is the Supreme Court really felt uncomfortable imposing death penalty. Because you have to remember, this is irreversible. And if ever they committed a mistake, then it would not be undone anymore. So they tried to make use of every possible means to avoid it. And if you look back into the 2000 Rules of Criminal Procedure, and you are reading cases that were decided before then, you might have 
wondered why in the past. Aggravating circumstances which were not alleged in the information were still considered for the purpose of imposing the penalty. But under the 2000 rules of criminal procedure, an aggravating circumstance must be alleged in order that it will be considered for the imposition of the penalty. So in the past, even if not alleged, because the only aggravating circumstance that would need to be alleged would be the qualifying circumstances, the generic aggravating circumstances would still be utilized to aggravate the crime. But nowadays, because of <coughs> the amendment of the rules brought about by rule or by the 2000 rules of criminal procedure, that cannot be done anymore. If you want the aggravating circumstances to be factored in, then they must be alleged in the information. In <coughs> People versus Abulon, the Supreme Court discussed the difference between the traditional rape and rape by sexual assault brought about by the amendment of the law. So they may be termed both as rape, but there is a difference. If someone charged with rape by sexual intercourse, but he is eventually found guilty of rape by sexual assault, then he cannot be convicted of either. Why? The information is for rape by sexual assault. So that is a traditional rape. There is penetration by the male organ of the female organ. But under the amendment to the law on rape, rape could also be committed even if it is not by this means. So facing a male's instrument in the mouth of a woman to be raped, or the anal orifice and so on. In the case of Abolon, he was charged with rape by sexual intercourse. What was proven, however, was rape by sexual assault because he allegedly placed his tongue in the female orifice. So that is rape by sexual assault. Since the evidence did not match the information, then the Supreme Court said he cannot be found guilty of either rape. Does it mean to say that he was then free? No, not necessarily. The Supreme Court said he is guilty of acts of lasciviousness. If necessarily acts of lasciviousness would be included in both instances. So that's the case of people versus Apollon. In regard to right to speedy, impartial, and public trial, let's first talk about speedy trial. Take note of what the Supreme Court said in the case of Lapson. This is being Lapson. First in all. While the general idea is the right to speedy trial is supposed to benefit the accused, the Supreme Court said that in some instances, it's actually the accused who would be interested in delaying the proceedings. So why would an accused be interested in delaying the proceedings? Because by delay, certain pieces of evidence may already start to disappear. Or some witnesses may no longer be around. And that would, of course, be beneficial to the accused. Without evidence against them, how can the case proceed? But generally, it is for the benefit of the accused. 
So try to correlate that to what you'll be doing in March next year. You will now be looking forward to the re release of the bar results. And any rumor would be met with great expectations. If somebody told you that the results would be coming out March 15th, then you would tend to believe that. And towards March 15th, you would already perhaps be having nightly or nightly nightmares. <laughs> Nobody can understand why you keep shouting in the middle of the night. <laughs> and then on the 14th of March, perhaps you will not be able to sleep. The following day comes, but no results. False alarm. Okay. So any time now, somebody again texts you and says, it will be on the 20th. And you will go through the same experience again. 20th passes and nothing. End of the month, the same thing. It's now April. So, you're telling yourself any time now, because this has been the usual timetable for the release of the bar results. On April the 15th, there is an announcement at the web page of the Supreme Court that the bar results would be released in July. How would you feel? So the same way when it comes to the right to speed it by up. There should not be that kind of delay that would only make life difficult for everyone. If the accused is found innocent, then let it be decreed as soon as possible so that he would not have to be thinking about it all the time. Or even if he is found to be guilty, that would be much better than always having this idea hanging in his mind. And he doesn't know what to do and he cannot otherwise plan for the future. But if he is now a judge guilty, he may, for instance, move for reconsideration or take an appeal. At least he has now moved forward instead of simply worrying all the time and Griggs would now have his toll on his emotional health. <laughs> In the case of Magad, he was complaining not of delay, instead of overspeeding justice. <laughs> How did that happen? The charge against him was filed after lunch. Trial proceeded until 7 o'clock in the evening. The following day, the trial continued. And before lunch, there was a judgment of condition. <laughs> Quite fast, right? So he was complaining of overspeeding justice. The Supreme Court said, you have not been denied due process. You were informed of the charge, and you will have the opportunity to talk to your lawyer, consult with your lawyer, and present your own side. It's just that you were prosecuted under a particular general order, because then shortly after martial law, which required that criminal cases or offenses against tourists should be decided within 24 hours. So perhaps the intention of Marcos then was to attract tourists. But how can you attract tourists to stay and come to Philippines if they would have to wait for too long just to have the cases that they might have filed against those who committed crimes against them? try for so long. So the earlier these are decided, then the better for the tourists, because they would not have to unduly stay long in the Philippines. On the other hand, Guerrero represents another extreme. What is the fastest way to travel 
from Manila, for instance, to Cebu, aside from your dreams. That would be by plane, right? So Guerrero now represents an irony. Way back in 1969, how old were you then? Guerrero, a pilot, flew certain passengers from Nueva Ecija to Manila International Airport. That was the flight plan. However, because he did not check on the fuel of his plane, instead of landing at Manila International Airport, they went fishing in Malamon. <laughs> And unfortunately for him, he survived, but his passengers died. So he was charged for that reckless imprudence. So the incident was way back in 1969. In 1996, that's 27 years later, the case reached the Supreme Court. So you would expect, of course, that this would be now on the merits as to whether he is guilty or not. No, the issue was whether he had been deprived of the guarantee of the right to speed the trial. <laughs> So how did it happen? After 27 years, you're talking about right speed trial? What happened was that through the years, the case had been transferred to one court, then to another, and so on. And the judges also kept changing. Then eventually, the judge who was supposed to decide the case already prepared to decide when we realized that the transcripts were incomplete. So he ordered the retaking of the testimony of the witnesses whose transcripts were missing. And here, Guerrero now complained that that would be a denial of his right to due process. The case got to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said no, there was no denial of due process or of right to speedy trial. The, right, the guarantee of the right to speedy trial is against vexatious, unreasonable, and oppressive delays. But here, there is no such characteristics for the delay that occasioned your case. As a matter of fact, you have something to do with that delay. When your case was practically sleeping, you did not do anything. You just simply waited. Then when the judge tried to start the case moving, that's the only time that you now came forward and complained about your right to speedy trial. You cannot do that. Accordingly, the Supreme Court said, the case proceeds. I don't know whatever happened to that case. 1996. And by that time, do you think we'll still be able to locate the witnesses? So that's the irony when the fastest form of transportation comes face to face with the face of Philippine justice. On the guarantee of impartial trials or judges, we have that old case involving Imelda. She was charged before the Sandigan Bayan. And when the justices were about to decide, they realized that they could not have a unanimous decision. So based on their internal rules, the Sandigan Bayan presiding justice constituted a special division of five members. Then one day, Three of these members attended the budget session or budget hearing in Congress. And after that, they proceeded to eat in a restaurant 
for lunch. So there were three from that division, and they were joined by a fourth member of the Sandigan Bayan, but who did not belong to that special division. Over lunch, they had Imelda. No, they did not eat her. They discussed her case. By the end of their lunch, the three who were members of the division had already a unanimous decision as to how to dispose of the case. So when they went back to the Sandigan Bayan, the presiding justice decided to dissolve the original or the special division of five, since there was already the necessary unanimity. The judgment was for conviction. It was appealed to the Supreme Court, and the division affirmed the conviction. Imelda, being Imelda, she filed a motion for reconsideration with prayer that the matter be referred to the court and bank. The court and bank obliged and reversed. So what does this got to do with impartial trial? The Supreme Court majority said that what the justices did in this case violated the rule on impartiality because by their actuations, they somehow prejudiced the rights of Imelda. For one, it was improper for them to have been discussing the case outside the halls of Sandigan Bayan. They should just have discussed it in, in Sandigan Bayan itself instead of discussing it privately over lunch. For another, only three of the five members were present. While three would constitute the majority, the same would be violated of the very spirit why you have a collegiate court in the first place. Because each member who is supposed to be part of that division should participate, even if they're just in the minority. Because you never know what would happen if the other members heard the views of the other two members. The three members might already have made, their, made up their mind among themselves. But if they heard the other two members, then there's still a possibility that they might have changed their views. So it was improper to exclude the other two members, even if the three would already be a majority. And finally, the Supreme Court said it was improper to allow a fourth member from Sandigan Bayan that was not a member of that division to participate in the discussions because he has nothing to do with that case. So with this kind of reasoning, the Supreme Court finally said that Imelda should be acquitted. Another case involving a Marcos close attache, instead of Tabuena. He used to be the general manager of Manila International Airport. And shortly before the staff elections, he delivered to Malacanang cash that supposedly for payment of the airport's liability to PNCC. The proceeding or the procedure was rather unusual and irregular, if not criminal. Because why would he be delivering to Malacanang what is the airport's liability to PNCC? But his defense was, I could not have done otherwise, because that was a direct order coming from Malacanang. But what is significant here is how the Supreme Court ended up acquitting Tabuena. The Supreme Court noticed that the questions asked by the justices of the Sandigan Bayan totaled more than the combined questions asked by the prosecution and the defense. So what difference does it make? Well, in the reading of the Supreme Court, this meant that the Sandigan Bayan justices acted more as prosecutors rather than impartial judges. Therefore, this was a consideration taken into account to invalidate the judgment against Tabuena. In the case of Webb, 
he was just in the limelight again, right? <coughs> he questioned the impartiality of Judge Tolentino. And the Supreme Court said, in order to be able to make out the case against the alleged bias of the judge, you must be able to show by her actuations and not by strenuous evidence the clear basis for that bias. So if it is merely a mistake, for instance, that she might have committed in ruling with regard to certain objections, then that would not be enough basis to claim that she is biased. So in the recent decision on Webb, he is supposed to have the benefits of DNA testing, right? Yes. And the FBI said, sorry, but we don't have the specimen. <laughs> we gave it to the court, the trial court before, presided by Judge Tolentino. Now, what could have happened to that? It dried up or what? <laughs> It's just like saying so close yet so far, right? <laughs> we'll see what will happen. In regard to public trial, we have that request before for the live coverage of the Thunder trial of ERA. But the Supreme Court majority relied on what the Taylor said in a minute resolution involving the trial of the criminal case that was filed by Corey Pino against Louis Beltran and company. And the Supreme Court is basically of the idea that allowing for live coverage by the media of these trials may impair the entitlement of the accused to due process. It was said, for instance, that certain persons, from judges, lawyers, to witnesses, may behave differently if they knew that they were being covered live by radio and television. So in that way, they would not be acting the same way that they should do in these public trials, and that may have a distorting effect on their performance to the prejudice of the accused. On motion for reconsideration, the Supreme Court modified its decision. It still maintained that there would be no live coverage. However, it said that in view of the importance and historical relevance of this particular case, then the proceedings should be recorded, but there would be no broadcast of the same until a judgment shall have been rendered. The cameras would be from a fixed place, then they would continue, continually record these proceedings. So, assuming they have done that, you would now have a library full of these recordings, right? Who would be interested to still watch this? We have so many other things, pressing things, that you would rather them do, right? Like, prepare for the bar. And after you pass the bar, there will be other things that you would again concern yourself with, other than a trial that practically produced nothing. Because you had a conflict, but he immediately got pardoned. What a waste of resources. In regard to right of confrontation or cross-examination, this is also quite important because it enables an accused, for instance, to determine whether a witness is lying and thereby expose these lies for the trial court to appreciate and lead probably to his acquittal. Or even if the witness is not lying, through cross-examination, 
the accused may be able to present another angle or get the bigger picture, which would then make the judge understand what really happened. Normally, if a witness is presented, of course, he would only be testifying and giving the version that is needed by the person or the party presenting him. For instance, the accused is charged of having stopped someone. The witness for the prosecution would come in with a testimony saying that, indeed, the accused stabbed the victim. What if, by cross-examination, it is now shown that actually it was the victim who was the aggressor and that the accused was just defending himself? So, by cross-examination, you can now come up with a clearer picture, the bigger picture, by which you can really appreciate what happened. Instead of the one-sided narration, if not subject to the cross-examination, you would now instead see a picture from a different angle, and which would then be very helpful to the accused. In the case of People v. Pido, through cross-examination, the accused, or at least his lawyer, was able to prove that instead of a case of rape, it was more of a consensual desire for each other. And it turns out that Pido was charged with rape because of embarrassment on the part of the woman, because she was seen by somebody else shortly after they had done it, and that woman happens to have another husband. So if she was reported to the husband as having committed that act of adultery, then of course the husband would get enraged. But if it was shown through the crime or through the charge of rape that she was forced into it, then perhaps the husband would be more understanding, right? So that basically is the background for that case. But during cross-examination, it was shown that it was supposed to be consensual. But what I cannot understand is the court, as well as the defense counsel or the prosecution, simply allowed the defense counsel to keep on making use of the word love-making. So whenever she asked the complainant, he would ask using the word love-making, like, what did you do after your love-making? And the complainant, not knowing any better, simply answered, perhaps in the old, ordinary way that someone like in her position would have responded, because she's not that well-educated. So if the victim was a law student, of course it would be so much different, isn't it? He would say, I know the difference between love-making and rape. And did you ever notice that in the movies, whether a woman is being raped or whether she's enjoying it, sometimes she would, in most instances, be shouting, right? So it all depends on how the sound comes out. So if that were part of the cross-examination, then perhaps you can now determine whether it was really rape or something that they should have decided to do else. So that's the case of People v. Pido. In People v. Ortiz Miyake, we have here a case of a judge making use of simple arithmetic, like 2 plus 1 equals 3. So what was it all about? 
you very well know that the act of illegal recruitment may constitute both a violation of the law against illegal recruitment as well as a staffer. And when the crime of illegal recruitment is committed against three or more victims, then it's illegal recruitment in large scale. In this case of Ortiz Miyake, there were three victims. <coughs> Two of them earlier filed cases of estafa against Ortiz Miyake in Parañaque. And these cases <coughs> led to her conviction. Subsequently, the third victim filed also a case for Stapa and illegal recruitment in large scale, this time in Makati. During the trial for the case on illegal, illegal recruitment in large scale, only one of the victims, the one who filed the case, was able to testify because the other two were already able to secure foreign employment. So they were not able to show up. Just the same, when the judge rendered his decision, it was for illegal recruitment in large scale. How did he do it? When there, only, there was only one witness, one complainant before him. Simple. He had one complainant, one of the victims, in his particular court. But then there were two earlier convictions for Stafa. So one plus two equals three. Therefore, illegal recruitment in large scale. The Supreme Court said you cannot do that. It's not the same as reproducing testimony in a former trial. You have to remember that the judgment is representative of the conclusion of the judge about the guilt of the accused before him. So the fact that there was a conviction in the Stafa cases may be part of the facts, but the same would not prove the commission of, of illegal recruitment in large scale because the same had not been testified to by the requisite number of complainants in your courtroom. So that's the case of Orpiz Miyake versus, or people versus Orpiz Miyake. In the case of people versus Narca, the widow of the victim testified in the prosecution of the, the persons who killed her husband. She was able to finish her direct testimony, but when she was supposed to be subjected for cross-examination, the defense counsel asked that the same be conducted during the next hearing. During the next hearing, the witness did not show up anymore. Why? Because in the meantime, she had already been sent to join her husband. She was also killed. So there's no one to cross-examine. And the defense counsel now asked the court to strike off the record, the direct testimony of the, of the spouse or of the wife. The Supreme Court said no. The right to cross-examine means that you be given the opportunity to cross-examine. Such that if you've lost that opportunity because of your own fault, then you cannot subsequently claim that you were denied the right. Here, you had already the opportunity. It's just that you asked for another day to conduct the cross-examination. So if that day would never come because the witness would no longer be made to testify, then it is your fault. Therefore, whatever she said should be retained in the records of the case. So that's the case of People v. Narca. In regard to compulsory process, take note of what the Supreme Court said in the case of People v. Chuba. 
that this is an expanding right comparing the language of the 1935 Constitution with the 1973 and the 1987 Constitutions. When it comes to the 1975 Constitution, it was only with regard to the presence of counsel, or I mean presence of a witness, a person who may testify for the accused. Now, it also includes the production of other evidence. So this Supreme Court said is for the purpose of showing the expansion of the right, not merely the production of witnesses now, but also that of other evidence, like documentary evidence. However, take note also that until now, polygraph examination results are not considered reliable. And therefore, an accused may not insist on making part of the record polygraph examination results that might be favorable to him. So no matter that they may be working to his advantage, he cannot insist on their being considered as part of the evidence for him because they are, as of now, still generally considered as unreliable. In regard to trials in absentia, you have to remember that this is something that may only be allowed if there have been a prior arraignment. So in the absence of an arraignment, no trial in absentia could still be held. However, the moment there has been an arraignment, it would also be proper for the judge to, to archive the case if the accused jumped bail. Because precisely trials in absentia have been put in, starting with the 1973 Constitution, to avoid the usual practice in the past of having to archive the case every time that the accused jumped bail. This time, if he jumps bail, just proceed with the trial and proceed also with the, with the rendition of a judgment. So if it is acquittal, good for the accused. But if it is for conviction, then he should surrender himself to the jurisdiction of the court before that decision becomes final. So that if he wants to question that judgment, he would still have a chance to do it. What if he really thinks it was wrongly decided? If it does not show up, then that will become final. And therefore, he will no longer be allowed to question the same when he gets rearrested, for instance. On habeas corpus, again, you have to remember that this is about the legality of one's confinement or detention. So it provides an expeditious manner by which you can determine whether there's really a basis for the detention of a person or not, instead of having to go through the normal criminal process. If somebody has been arrested by the police and the relatives think that there is no basis for that arrest, then a writ of, or a writ of habeas corpus may be applied for. So under that remedy, the court would now direct the police authorities to explain and justify their holding on to that person. If they can produce a warrant of arrest, then that would be the authority for them. Therefore, that would be the end of the proceedings. But if they cannot, then the court would have to order the release of the person in detention. The problem, however, with habeas corpus is that it is only for the purpose of determining the legality of a person's detention. So if the respondents, those suspected of holding in detention, the person being sought, would deny that they have him in their jail, for instance, then that would be the end of the 
trick because how could the policeman possibly try to justify holding on to someone that they even deny having in their custody. There's nothing to justify. So we have the problems now of extra legal hearings and enforced disappearances. Somebody suddenly disappeared. The policemen deny having him in their custody. Under the rate of Amparo, it is not enough for the policemen to say, sorry, we don't have him here. If it is within their jurisdiction, then they have to show what they have done, to investigate what might have possibly happened to this person. So it's not enough for them to simply look at you black height. They have to show that they exercise extraordinary diligence to determine what might have happened to this person. If he disappeared, then did they investigate? Did they follow leads? And so on and so forth. Or if he's already dead, did they discover him? In the first Amparo case, it was decided by the Supreme Court. That's the case of Secretary of National Defense versus Manalo. The Supreme Court explained the origin of this particular remedy. It's from Mexico. And various types of amparo are also being used in different Latin American countries. Anyway, the Supreme Court explained that the writ of amparo is for purposes of protection, particularly with regard to security concerns, like the <clears throat> integrity of one's physical and emotional well-being. If you are threatened, then that is a threat to your security. The court also explained that the word amparo itself comes from the Spanish word for condom. No. The Supreme Court did not say that. It's protection. But that is already synonymous with that kind of an instrument. <laughs> Just make sure that you don't keep that in mind when, if ever, that is asked in the bar. So it's protection, not condom. Otherwise, the examiner might just keep on laughing all the time and, and get prevented from further checking your papers. In the Morrison case of Razon versus Nagipis, the Supreme Court said that the remedy of grief of amparo is something still evolving. So it depends upon how it would eventually find its place in Philippine jurisprudence and <clears throat> in Philippine law. But the court highlighted the fact that the rules must be construed in a way that is flexible because of the problems that we precisely encounter in matters like this, like enforced disappearances or extra-legal killings. It would be very difficult to prove this or even to follow this in this regard if you abide by the normal rules. So there's a need for greater flexibility in order to make the remedy something that's workable. As a matter of fact, hearsay evidence may be relied upon if the same considered with other facts and circumstances would tend to support the allegation or the contention that the person has been taken, for instance, by elements of the military establishment and the like. It would really be very difficult to prove that 
military men were involved. Because, of course, if they want to cover their tracks, they would have to do everything. So you have now to piece up the pieces and even possibly rely on hearsay evidence. We we'll just continue with self incrimination tomorrow. Basically, we're putting